Welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Mikkel Thorpe, and this is the Expat Money Show. Today's guest is an American-born entrepreneur and adventurer. Raised in Beachtown during California's golden age, he became a self-described well-educated surfer who gathered real-world experiences and realized that the prescribed life path was not for him. He currently lives with his wife in southern Brazil, and he's also an admin in our private Facebook group at expatmoneyforum.com. Please welcome to the show, Jim Leonards. Jim, how are you? I'm very well, Mikhail. It's good to see your face again. It's been a year. Exactly. I, you know, you came over to Panama and we had to have, we got to have a very nice dinner and a very good conversation. And we've been friends for several years now because of the, our, our group at Expat Money Forum. So I think it is very fitting to, to have you on the show. And I'm excited for today's conversation. Why don't you kind of Start by walking us through your backstory a little bit. You know, let's let's go into why you left California and maybe why you chose Brazil. Um, let's see. Why did I leave California? Uh, divorce uh, started it. You know, I had one and a half million frequent flyer miles, and whenever my kids weren't available and I was under a non compete because I sold uh, uh, my equity in a software company that I founded. Um, I was Mr. Mom when the kids weren't available. I just got on a plane and went where I was comfortable. So in the beginning, it was uh, Chile, Peru, right? And then uh, was on the way back and uh, stopped. And I don't know if you remember this. You remember the Economist magazine with uh, uh, Cristo Hedentor taking off off of Rio and it said Brazil rising? I don't yeah, remember so that specific one, but I've been a, I've read The Economist since... For well over 20 years, but uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so it was, it was 2007-ish or so. You know, Brazil's economy was taking off. And, you know, I was in Santiago getting on a plane to fly to L.A. And uh, thought, and I said, hmm, interesting, you know. Um, and then I ended up in a Deloitte office in downtown L.A., Um on a rainy Monday, I was interviewing. I was going to go back to the corporate world because I had to divest as part of the divorce, the software company, um, because the valuation was just the argument there was just too big. And I said, well, I know how to take care of valuation. You sell it. Right. Um, so I, I literally packed the bag, told my partners uh, 30 days, I'll be back and uh, give me your best and final offer and we'll we'll be done with this. Right. Uh, picked up that magazine, read it, said, I don't think that agreement I'm going to sign is going to include Brazil because we've never done business south of Panama. Mm -hmm. And off I went. So, uh, yeah, that ended up later on getting me back here and I fell in love. If you want me to go into that, just tell me. Um, yeah, let's 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 dive into Brazil. So you just you came down to Brazil for a vacation to see what the country was like, just to kind of no, get no, 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 much different than that. So okay. I read this. I read this magazine article, and I'm in that Deloitte office in L.A. and everything's backed up. I'm waiting for an interview. Right, I had called one of the guys I had gone to grad school with, and said, "Hey, I want back in because Cap Gem and I had bought Ernst Young Consulting." Right. And I had gone to a boutique firm for a little bit with basically managers and above started that firm in real estate construction development. And I knew I couldn't go back there. So the only other big, big, uh, well, five or four at the time, because there was a transition point right there um, that had a real estate practice was Deloitte. And I had guys that were, you know, in management over there from grad school. So I called them. They got me the interview. And, you know, long story short is I'm standing in the lobby, spoke enough Spanish, but I hadn't really been using it to know that what I heard was, I mean, you've been to Brazil, you speak Spanish, right? Mm -hmm. You knew it was close, right? And so I turned around and because of that magazine, I had I knew two phrases, bom dia to the band, right? And she was speaking Portuguese on the phone, right? Mm -hmm. So I said, she hung up. I said, bom dia to the band. And she looked at me and started just going off. And I was like, <laughs> that's all I know. Right. Long story short, uh, IBM Professional Services had a contract administration and billing unit in Sao Paulo. And she was in the United States every 
30 days or so. And we just started a friendship. And then she said, why don't you come to Brazil? So first time I was in Brazil was uh, Sao Paulo, right? Uh, she picked me up at the airport, took me to Campinas. She had to work. And we drove out to Ilabella. Uh, do you know Il- Ilabella? I don't. Tell me about it. Uh, yeah, it's 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 a resort island. You go to Sao Sebastião, right, outside of Sao Paulo, and then you take a ferry over to the island. And I had never felt at home in California, the United States. The only time I ever felt at home was in the ocean, right? And the Pacific Ocean, because the Atlantic never really was right. The smell was never right. You know, I I had been, I traveled to other places to surf because like I said, self-described, well-educated surfer. And I'm sitting on the beach in Ilabella. It was my first experience with caipirinhas. I had four in in an afternoon. (laughs) So (laughs) exactly right. (laughs) (laughs) And I'd be eating shrimp and it was uh, April. Right. It was off season, but the weather was still good. And I saw this this thunderstorm across over, you know, the channel on the mainland. And it came, started heading our way. And, I, you know, everybody leaves the beach, including my friend. Right. And then it basically almost dumps on me and I'm smelling Brazil with the with the soil being getting wet. Right. Mm hmm. The ocean, like I said, I was happy because I was close to the ocean. It wasn't my ocean, right? But then I smelled Brazil, and I was like, I was literally an epiphany, right? I mean, you know, my vision of the Savior wasn't there, but I was home. Sure. And so, so then it was just, okay, how do I make this real, right? And I had responsibilities in the U.S. I had two two children that were not adults yet. They're both adults now. And I just started, well, you know, I've got several. I still have over a million frequent flyer miles. So whenever the kids weren't available, I got on an airplane. And I was Mr. Mom the other times, right? And so that started and I traveled all over Brazil. trying well, to find I definitely where understand was. your your affinity for Brazil and the feeling of home. You know, I've been traveling for 23 years and I've been to Brazil a dozen times. Now, the first couple of times were Rio and Sao Paulo and and I liked it. You know, it was it was good. You know, it was for me, yeah. it was another country. And then I made it to southern Brazil and I made it to Florianopolis. And mm-hmm. I'm there with my wife and we rent a vehicle and we live in there for six months. And we had a nice, cute little apartment. It was just a pair of us. And we go to the beach and we were there off season as well. It wasn't peak season. It wasn't hot weather. We were wearing winter jackets and and uh, and a beanie, a toque, you know, and yeah. walking down the beach and meeting people and having caparin. My jacket. There my you go. Jacket. That's <laughs> what I wear when I go out. Yeah, people you know? seem to think, oh, it's all, um, you know, thongs and uh, and sunshine. And it's like, no, southern Brazil gets proper cold. But yeah. I, I look at the water, I look out at the ocean, and I swear it's made of diamonds. Like it just, it sparkles yeah. in a way that nowhere else, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, right? It's yeah, just, yeah, exactly. It's there's there's just something play different. Of the light and the clouds and the ocean being disrupted by the wind. There's a sparkle to the ocean there that's insane. Yeah. I mean, I lived in the South Pacific. I lived in Asia. I lived in the Middle East on the Indian Ocean or on the the Persian Gulf. I lived uh, all over North America. I live here in Panama on the Caribbean and the Pacific. You know, it's not the same. It's just not the same. That, that, That water in southern Brazil, if you haven't seen it, like if you've seen it, you you, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. And if you haven't seen it, you think, Mikhail, you're so weird, like you're crazy, but you got to see it. What's, uh, for instance, Mikhail, when the first time you were in uh, Lagoji Conceição, huh? and you yep. were across, sorry, I almost said ta to you, <laughs> as if you were were speaking Portuguese, and you go, you start across the the little bridge there. I know it to head over towards uh, Praia Mole or mm-hmm. uh, Juquinha, right? And you look at the color of the Lagoa, or even as you come over from Centro, right? Yep. 
Yeah, and down the hill, and then that scary winding hill that comes down, and somehow you see people cycling up it, and you're like, what? Like, I'd be, uh, my lungs would be burning after about 25 seconds, and these people are going all the way to the top of the mountain. They're crazy. Yeah, and and the motorcycle's passing you on the two-lane road, with surfboard carriers strapped to the side. It's just, but it all just kind of works, right? Yep. So, So let's... Since we're having the conversation, and I know others are listening, right? Um, that's about the time I started heckling the hell out of you in the group, right? Yeah, about because my port- pronunciation Portuguese. of Portuguese. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I, you were one of the reasons I stayed very involved because I, been, you know, I'm a long-term expat, and I really don't interact with expats, Sure. right? Um, I believe you got to be fully assimilated and speak the language. And I think that's the safest way to be in a culture, which, you know, tying back to your other podcast, Parallel Systems, I believe it was the title. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That gentleman in Poland, he's playing my game. He's just playing it in a different place. Right. Sure. Um, but you, you put up with my abuse, you know, <laughs> I like and the abuse. People, I want to be called on it. I'm not shy of it at all. I mean, if you're on the yeah. email newsletter at expatmoney.com, hey, if you say something to me, let's let's discuss it. Let's talk about it. You know, I'll I'll go yeah, through that's things. That's how I am. But yeah. some people get some people get offended by me. Sure. And you know, and and I'm okay with that because I as I tell my daughter who's 25 now, right? If everybody likes you, that means you don't have an opinion that that's worth a damn. Sure. Right. What's important, and I think it's why people put up with me, and I, I'm sure it's why you put up with me, is I can be, I can push people's buttons and all that, but it's because I want to know what you think. And all I, I if we disagree, I don't care. Mm-hmm. All I care is, is that you're polite and your ears open. Yep. And you can disrespect my opinion. And I'm completely okay with that. But if you disrespect me or somebody else, you're going to get it. Sure. Well, I you think know? that it's important to to have conversations that, okay, so a lot of the millennial generation will not have confrontation about anything. They're, they're very yeah. confrontation adverse. I don't care. I mean, I'll... I'll talk to someone, I'll tell them if I think I'm wrong and and I'll go through things line by line. I mean, let's yeah. let's discuss it. I, but I agree with you. Don't, you know, the ones that I usually call out on the newsletter are the ones that are swearing at me or screaming at me about something and it's like oh. I never yeah. I never said the f word to you. I mean, like I I didn't call you these types of things and I won't do it as a response. I mean, I'll I'll go through line by line on why I think they're wrong, but I'll still keep it pretty uh, civil, I would say. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've actually got, I don't, I don't know if you ever saw it. And, and again, you know, like total respect for you, right? Because like I said, you put up with me and I and immediately I knew you got me, right? Um, you know, I, I literally posted and you know i'm a long-winded bastard okay sh- i don't know if i can say that right uh, you can you can say no problem yeah i mean i apologize publicly in the group for being less than i should have been sure right and i had talked to susan about it mm-hmm. and i said you know i screwed up i'm a, i need your opinion and i'm gonna apologize and i'm 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 not touching that piece again mm-hmm. right and yeah, that's if everybody acted that way, I'd be okay with it. And I would make my life and Susan's life and Mark's life and everybody's life, you know, easier. You know, I think that's that's what we need as a group, as a community, and that by extension, a world, right? And for everybody listening, so this is at the expatmoneyforum.com. This is our private group with probably 12 and a half, close to 13,000 people in the group. And Jim, one of the reasons that I personally asked you to step up as an admin on the group is because you do write out thoughtful answers and you you take the time to respond to people. If people don't like the answers they get, well, that's their decision. That's how they view things and the world, you know? Um, yeah. And you're not responsible for anybody else's feelings. 
But I do like that you'll get in there and you'll call people on their BS and you'll be very frank it's, with them. It, it's not even BS, okay? Like I, I, before we started, right? As we were getting ready to do this, because I like to stand in the backgrounds. I'm not the. I, I don't like to be the guy, the front, the front guy, okay? But I, I, I shared a, a thing with you. Like I, I had an interaction on an other expat group, Brazil group, right? A young man basically wanted to tell me all about Florianopolis and Southern Brazil. You know, he'd been there four months and he was just spewing crap. And, you know, I called him out and then he got, I'm trying to be good. Okay. He got all butthurt. <laughs> You know, and told me I was a jerk and didn't know Brazil. And, and I've had people in our group do that to me. You know, I don't know South America. Uh, OK, uh, I think I kind of know it, you know. Um, you know, I, you can disagree with me, but if you're going to tell me, I, I don't know what I I know. And but, you know, I, I have a problem with that. And I'll, I, I don't have a problem telling you that. So. Not that that's what I, again, I don't know why the hell you chose to talk to me, but <laughs> if that was the reason, okay. Otherwise, you know. Well, I think it's fun yeah. to have you on the podcast because you are a valuable member of the community, Jim. You have been very generous with your time over the last couple of years and sorting people out and answering a lot of questions. And I like you. I think you're a good guy. And you and I have sat down and shared meals together. And we've talked on the phone. That's important. It's, it yeah. is important. You know what? It's so important. And not enough people realize that in today's day and age. They feel no. like everything can be digital. Everything can be online. I think that there is still something to shaking a man's hand looking them in the eye and and sharing a meal with them. I mean, that might be an old fashioned kind of thing, but you know, I think it's important. So do you know the genesis of why breaking bread is important? Tell me. Well, okay. My understanding of it is, is when two people get together and they share a meal together, that is an admission that they are open to having a real relationship because, you know, that's a way, good way to poison somebody. Sure. Right. So when I let you into my home and feed you or whatever, or share, you know, a drink with you or whatever, it's a bonding I will never get in, in the digital age, right? But I'm driven in the digital age now, right? I, and the whole group, I, my, my whole interaction with exclusion of Panama, three days, two and a half days on my way home to Brazil, right? That's it. I don't I have never met anybody in the group outside of that. Mm -hmm. Right. And I had hoped to go to Florianopolis more than I have since I've been home. But I hadn't seen my wife in almost a year. Right. Mm -hmm. Because of the death of my sister and all that. Right. And so we're and I was re I've reorganized the way I approach the world. And maybe that's where we take the conversation. Right. Um, I, I was shocked that, you know, and don't be offended by this. You know that I'm just kind of opening the conversation that you were a guy who was involved with crypto and everything else. And then I heard your podcast of what am I doing? I, again, if I get the, the title incorrect, forgive me. But you start saying I'm in real estate. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. And I'm thinking to myself, gosh, uh, <laughs> Mikhail and I are approaching the current situation the same way. Right. So and, how would you think that I would get offended by that situation or that statement? No, but you know, a lot of the crypto guys are very uh, protective of the crypto space. I get that. Right. Yeah. I've never been a like a crypto bro. You know, I look at Bitcoin like I first of all, to set the record straight, I'm not a Bitcoin maxi. I think that there are some other great projects out there, but there are, you know, 99999 percent are absolute crap. I mean, I've always said that in the last seven years yeah. that I've been involved in crypto. I like a lot of the ideas on Bitcoin on sovereign money, but I did release an episode of what am I doing with my own money? What am I doing with my own life? And I yeah. really, um, 
outline the way that I see the world. Because, you know, to be dogmatic about these types of things is a disservice. I think that we need to be transparent and 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 open to new ideas. Now, I've been into real estate for well over 20 years, but I am certainly reorganizing a lot of my life away from equities, away from large, like, I mean, I still hold crypto, but the percentage wise might be lower than it was. And I'm really going into tons of foreign real estate and the way that I'm holding it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very careful about, I, maybe I'm not taking the same types of risks that I was before or looking at it the same way that I was before, but we have to but, modify, you know, because things have changed, the world changed. So we have to change as well. Yeah. I mean, the crypto thing, it, I totally get it from a decentralization, right? The scariest thing. I mean, what was that movie? You're probably too young to remember this movie, right? You're, you're, I'm 61 and I know you're 40-ish, right? Mm -hmm. So Sandra Bullock had a, a thing called the web, right? Early on, probably 90s or 80s. And they, they basically made her go away. They shut off her identity in the digital world, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think that's what we're starting to bump up against, aren't we? I saw that there was a gentleman, an English uh, guy, he just, uh, his bank closed his accounts. You, you know, English politician, yeah, and yeah. very outspoken on a lot of these things. And now well-established large bank have shut his accounts and now going out there and trying to open accounts at other banks and they're refusing him because of all the publicity in the news. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so. You know, and, and and you're Canadian. Your baseline is Canadian, right? My baseline is mm -hmm. American. So mm -hmm. I have to approach the world differently than you because of the way the U.S. government wants to treat U.S. citizens, right? And so real estate's the one place I don't I don't have to declare it until I, you know, sell it. If mm -hmm. I have a gain, then I have to then I have to declare it. Otherwise, I don't, and it makes my life simple. Right. You have to you have to conform. But real estate opens up the world. The other thing that really interested me, what you were talking about, is you're getting involved with ag. Right. Agricultural land. Is sure. that true? Yeah, yeah. A lot more of this. I'm well, we can discuss these ideas on the the pluses and the negatives, because I'm it's one of those things that I'm investing in. And I think it's the right yeah. play, but at the same time, I also see that there are individuals out there who are actively trying to destroy the food supply and um, destroy uh, yeah, 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 yeah. The, but, uh, I, the sharing of food. So that, that kind of makes me nervous at the other side. Like, do I want to go to war with these people? I mean, that's... Well, let me, let me into my, my way of thinking, the evolution of it, right? I've always liked... Ag. I think when I was on one of your conference calls with regard to the school, mm -hmm. I think I think I ch in the chat I said, you know, I'm just a well. My, there's two phrases I'll use to self-describe. Okay. Okay. Well-educated surfer boy, right? And a dirt farmer. I don't know if you remember that, but I said, you know, I, I'm just a dirt farmer, right? Mm -hmm. Um. I think where you and I differ in the way we approach real estate is I actually put on a pair of mud boots and I'll, I'll, I'll dig a canal, you know, bust it open if I need to. Right. I don't, I'm not a daily farmer, mm -hmm. right. But I'm on the farms every week sure. and, and I've taken my, the way I approach farms from a couple of big pieces, right. To, I don't want anything bigger than 10, 20 acres, and I want them subdivided, ready to sell in pieces if I want to mm -hmm. for a, from a cash flow perspective. I don't because that makes the, the the problem with real estate is it's it's rather illiquid, right? And the problem with land is it doesn't cash flow, but ag land does, mm -hmm. right? And if I can structure deals that make sense and then, you know, leverage in my weirdness, right? <laughs> um, I have no problem getting and digging a hole. I've got no problem shoveling manure, you know? Um, 
I also got no problem making sure that the capital needs of the operations are is covered such that we get to where we want to go, right? And so if that's allowed me to be to do things that I don't think a lot of people are looking at, right? So well, definitely I'm the very, difference is not that I would be unwilling to do those things. You no, know, I, I'm not I'm not making that I'm not making that comment, right? I don't have little kids and all that other stuff. Yeah. My wife doesn't care if I go away for two or three days. Sure, sure, sure. Because you know what I have really realized over the last decade is that helping other people with my style of work, my industry, you know, the immigration, the tax, the relocation, that's my calling. And that's what I've dedicated my life to. And then I try to figure out ways that I can best serve people. So it's not that I would ever be prudish about rolling up my sleeves and doing farm work. Actually, I started working in farms at 12 years old, picking the weeds out of bean fields. That was my very first job. And I was doing that eight hours a day as a child. And another, I another commonality. Yep. Yeah. So yeah. it's never going to be like, oh, you know, Mikkel is uh uh, prudish or, you know, don't want to mess up my delicate, uh, my hands or something like this. No, I did manual labor jobs for many, many years. I always try to think now is like, how can I best serve people? And that for me is, is writing and is speaking. You know, those are the two things where I have the core competency and I can do better than anyone else. And then I yeah. leverage my time by paying other people to do things where I don't have that, uh, expertise. which I need to learn. I need to learn that again. Right. Mm. Because uh, I got to the point where I don't, I, I would not trust anyone unless I was doing it myself. And quite frankly, I'm not the smartest guy in the room on everything going on. Right. Um, you know, I, I, the other thing, and let me see what your opinion of it with ag is. You said, uh, well, let's, let's go back to if they want to control us, they need to make us fearful. Right. If they want to control us, they need to control where we live, how we access things, our money, uh, what yeah, else? Medicine, the, the health, food, the yeah. food, yeah, and food, all of it, right? Yep. So the ag and all that goes. How much have you? Uh, pay, how much have you been paying attention to the loss of heirloom uh, ag crops? A little bit. Yeah, a little bit. I mean, yeah. I'm not going to be able to quote you figures by any means, but definitely. No, no, no. No, but one of the things I've noticed, and this is the other thing, right? If you if you go to a small level ag, you need to make sure that you you do things that are allow you to make a profit, right? Because in monoculture, they do it by volume. It's commoditization, right? Correct. When you go small, You've got to play niche, right? So heirloom species helps, organic helps. Uh, uh, how much do I say that I, you know, I don't want everybody running in where I'm playing, right? But there are crops that pay more money, right? Uh, a, pound, a kilo of corn doesn't pay the same as a kilo of uh, shrimp or a kilo of uh, uh, mushrooms. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the quality of my life is better if I've got lion's mane mushrooms in my diet, right? Because it has neuroregenerative mm -hmm. things in it. I, and, and, and forgive me, and I'm well educated, right? Uh I'm kind of a science nerd, okay. mathematics nerd. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, undergrad was chemistry and econ and then I got I, I wanted a PhD in chemistry and had to take the consolation prize because I got allergic to everything in the OCHEM lab, right? And I was, you know, my where I wanted to go was organic synthesis. So that allows me to do things in the farm that, you know, the typical farmer wouldn't be able to do, but I can't, I'm not a farmer, right? And so we're leveraging different ways of growing in small footprints and allowing to have high turnovers and like, I mean, I kind of alluded to it, mm -hmm. uh, shrimp, uh, you know, fish, uh, integrated systems, containers, uh, 
uh, heat pumps so I can control the temperatures in uh, my greenhouses. It's funny, right? Where did I get the ideas for that? Uh, there's a bunch of guys up in Alberta, Canada doing it, right? I'm not a prepper, though. So, yeah, uh, that that's kind of where I'm at, where I'm playing. If somebody were to ask me what you're doing all the time, I'm either with my wife and taking care of family or I'm trying to figure out how I can get as much independence and freedom because they don't control my food. They don't control this. They don't control that. Right. Um, I sweep all my, you know, my bank accounts, I sweep them every month. Right. Um, do I worry about storing gold? Well, some, but not much. Right. Because I know what my rate of return is and I know what it, what it, that it tracks inflation. It just happens to have fur and hoofs, right? <laughs> Those kinds of things I feel safe with. I don't feel safe in the financial world, right? Sure. But let me let me push back a little bit. You feel safe okay. because you're in Brazil. Now, if you had the same type of setup and you had you had Ooh. livestock in California, how would you be feeling today? Uh, California is a dead state walking, right? I mean, that's one of the reasons I put in the bio for you. I lived in the golden age of California, right? One of the reasons I'm educated is I'll, I'll give you a, for instance, sometimes the millennials piss me off, right? But, you know, I've got two kids that are, you know, I, I got a 30, be 31 in August and my daughter's 25, right? Um, both of them will have completed college. My son, he's certified uh, air conditioning and he's a Navy certified welder and works in the ports of LA Long Beach, right? And he makes damn good money, mm -hmm. right? But uh, he doesn't. He he knows he needs to get out of California, right? And my daughter, she wanted, you know, her her education, I'll give you a for instance. University of California, when I went, $1,275 a year for an undergrad, wow. right? What's that, a week now in uh, in California? It's 18000 <laughs> in state, right? My graduate school education cost me $7,500 a year, right? It's $65,000 a year, right? I could work because I had skills, right? Um, my grandfather had made a deal with me. If you become a tradesman, then, you know, we can work through the school thing afterwards. If you go earlier, you, you know, it's, it's, we'll, we'll figure it out, right? I became a tradesman. So I could, I could work piecework over the weekend and make more than enough money to, you know, pay for my tuition one weekend. Right. Mm -hmm. um, for grad school, I had to work three weekends. So let's be real, but that doesn't exist now. Right. Um, what does an apartment cost in California now? You know, it's uh, that world doesn't exist. So agriculture in California, predominantly all monoculture, big fields. Have you been to California? Oh yeah, many times, many times. Yeah. Have you have you drove the Central Valley? Yep. Yeah, it's it's a monotonous drive. Yeah. You know, um, Brazil's different. Brazil's really different. You go up if you go to Mato Grosso do Sul or Mato Grosso uh, Strait, or you go into Sao Paulo, it's different. The South South's a very different Brazil, mm -hmm. right? It's very independent. I mean, my wife will tell you she's Gaucho first, right? Brazilian second. You know, mm -hmm. we fought a civil war. You know, uh, independent fighters. Uh, do you know about uh, Giuseppe Garibaldi and Anita? Mm, no, tell me. Okay, so Giuseppe Garibaldi was fleeing Italy because he was trying to he was fighting a civil war there, came here, fell in love with Anita in Laguna, Santa Catarina. And uh, she was a unique woman. And she was fighting in the civil war with uh, 
Santa where Santa Catarina and Rio Grande do Sul was fighting Imperial Brazil, right? Now, the Santa Catarina portion was only four months long, but Rio Grande do Sul, they pretty much fought that war for 10 years, right? Mm -hmm. There's a very deep culture here, and it's very independent, very independent. So I feel very safe here because that's the tradition here that's baked in, mm -hmm. right? That doesn't exist in, well, I think maybe it exists some in some parts of the South for the worst for the U.S. currently. But, you know, here I'm, I feel very safe here. And I feel very safe in the small farms and everything else. Well, this right? goes to my point on, you know, the caveats with investing in agricultural land. Would I be investing in agricultural land in Canada than the United States? Absolutely not. They're doing yeah. all kinds of weird things and saying that, fish have covids and bird flu and we're going to destroy your entire flock and stuff like that i just don't see that coming to southern brazil i don't think that no, they're gonna no, they're no. gonna allow or stand for any of this nonsense no 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 no. there's no way there's no way. I'll, I'll give you a, for instance i i was started down the path by the way you know that i'm slightly on the spectrum okay okay just so you know <laughs> <laughs> um, Thanks for clearing uh, that up, Jim. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm just I'm, my, my sister. My sister uh, did her thesis on autism in early '80s, right? Um, and uh, when my other sister passed, right, and I spent some time with my sister in Arizona, um, she was like, "I'm worried about you. You're. I'm worried that you have executive executive function problems, which is." Asperger's, right? Um, anyway, long story short, uh, how much do you know about seed banks? More about that than your other question, so that's for sure, yeah. Yeah, so seed banks, is it, it, it's actually illegal now some places in the United States to access the, uh, the crops that need to be pollinated, Right, which means that you can't get all the ones they allow you to plant. You can't get seed for sure you, from you know pulling pulling it off the plants. Right, letting yep, mature yep, yep, yep. to that phase. Um, the other thing that you have to worry about is, uh, and we have this problem in Brazil. Uh, I'm going to tell you a really bad joke in a second. Okay, okay. I'm going to give you a warning. Um, <laughs> Monsanto, right? with their uh, Roundup uh, glycophosphate, right? Yep. So, you know, that's your genesis of your uh, genetically engineered crops, right? Genetically modified. Um, they're patented. Well, there's been, there were some problems, not really in this area, but up in Paraná, where Farmers were getting sued, even though they weren't using that seed because they were up upwind of of the guy or downwind from the guys that were uh, using it. And now the genetic markers were showing up in their crops, right? And a lot of these guys would save seed for the next year, but now this their seed has the marker in it, mm -hmm. and so somebody would show up in the field and take a sample, and then suddenly they get a letter saying we're suing you. Right. Yeah. Copyright infringement, patent infringement. Yeah. Yeah. We've seen so, this in the States for decades now. I mean. Yeah. 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 So, you know what we call those guys that were sneaking into fields? Tell me. Fertilizer. <laughs> 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 right. I don't know what, I don't know if it happened, but that's kind of the joke. Yeah. Right. It's, it's not cool. You know, I, leave me alone. Let me. Let me do my thing. Don't take my money from me because you don't like my opinion. You know, that's that's what it's about. So and for Southern Brazil, besides the culture and, uh, you know, I'm home, I don't feel that risk. You know, so the gauchos always have a knife on them, right? Because we, we need it to cut our meat up when we do Chihasco, right? Mm -hmm. If you look at any of the stuff on YouTube. You see very nice custom knives being pulled out to cut Chihuahua, right? <laughs> uh, and there's a lot of guns here, legally, mm -hmm. right? So the criminals have to worry about that, right? I'll, 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 give, I'll give you another thing. Um, you know, we hear a lot in the, the 
the expat world, people knew they're worried about safety, right? So how do you feel about safety? What's well, your take on safety? I, it's the same as mine. I already know, but I, I want to hear you. I'm going to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> well, we recently did an entire episode just on safety. I believe, like I, I had someone actually comment to me. No, it wasn't a comment. I'll, I'll quickly tell a story. I got interviewed the other day on a podcast on, on someone else's program. And this was a, a Bitcoin maxi. And um, he's going on and on and on about El Salvador. And wants to know my opinion on El Salvador. And I tell him that there's legitimate safety concerns there. And he says, no, I've been there twice. I've been there twice in the last two years for a week each time and nothing happened to me. Therefore, you know, he didn't say it in so little words, but basically, therefore it is a safe country. Like that's really a dangerous way to look at this. This is a really a tough way to look at it, you know? Keep, keep going, I wanna hear how you perceive this. <laughs> Well, I mean, I mean, if the only judge of safety is that you didn't get murdered while you were in the country, that's a pretty like narrow line. Like that's a pretty razor thin between safe and not safe, right? I've yeah. been traveling for 23 years. I've been to 110 countries. I've been to North Korea and Iran. I've been all over Africa, most countries in Latin America. I have never been robbed. I've never been mugged. I've never been held up at gunpoint. I've never been beaten up. I've never had any of these ha things happen. That doesn't mean that I only went to safe countries. Actually, I went to safe countries and I went to not safe countries, you know? Yeah. And, you know, we can look at, well, what are the markers? What are we judging these things on? We can look at the statistics and government records. We can look at what do the local people say in the area and, and, and base on their experiences of living in the country but you can't just make a judgment on your own like little narrow subjective piece so i'll be very transparent and i'll be like okay i live in an area in panama which traditionally is considered safe however when i get out of an uber at night my security guard is right there i'm looking at him he's looking at me i have my keys ready i come out we go straight to the door i'm taking an uber black i know where the who the uber driver is it's all documented i get an email about it if my my wife my mother my family they go out we know exactly where they're going i live in a very considered a very 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 safe area in panama however i have situational awareness I look after myself, it comes down to personal responsibility for me. So now you can look at, okay, 23 years of traveling. Did nothing happen to Mikkel because A, he's lucky? Maybe. B, because he only went to safe countries. I'd probably argue with that one. Or C, because he takes responsibility and makes sure that he's not putting himself in dangerous situations. So it's you know, it's not a clear cut. There's like, a, there's a little from each of them, a little bit of give and take on these things. But for a cut, for someone to just go like, I go to this place and it's safe because nothing happened to me. For me, that's, it's bonkers. Like it just makes no sense. Especially over two weeks. Yeah, exactly. Right. You know? Yeah. 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 And no, I'll compare and contrast. Okay. I've been held up one time by gun. It was in Irvine, California. There right? you go. Now, Here's where I get, I kind of get upset with expats because I take responsibility, right? I know Orange County, California. I was raised there from the time I was three months old, right? I did something stupid sure. at the wrong time of day, at the wrong place, right? Uh, I've I've only had one issue in in uh, Brazil. And I, I, it happened in September of last year, and it was my fault. And I'm going to share it with you really quickly. Now, no, you know me, right? Um, I think you would probably, I, I, I know you have many Brazilians, uh, you know, that you work with, right? Mm -hmm. They probably would tell you I, I know Brazil pretty well. Definitely. Okay. So I live... When I, when I was gone for the, the long period of time, I was talking to my wife. I said, you know, I want to do this, 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 and this. We, we were living in a very nice place in Puerto Lago. We had a flat there, right? Mm -hmm. Good neighborhood. Probably probably I'm more comfortable living down. You know, I don't need the, the best neighborhoods and all that, right? Mm -hmm. My wife decided that we didn't need, we were leasing the place, right? 
she decided we didn't need it anymore. So it was May before I saw you. And I called my wife and there was all kinds of noise. I'm like, what's going on? And she says, oh, I'm moving. I'm like, would you find a new man? And she, she's like, no. <laughs> and she <laughs> goes, you told me that you wanted to start working again. So our lease ran out. So I moved, I'm moving back to my old place, a flat that she owns, right? That's where I'm at today. I'm 300 meters from a favela, mm. right? I don't go over there except for during the day. I'm also, you know, if I go the other direction, I'm on a ma- one of the major streets in Porto Alegre. And, you know, I got, I've got the private bus system that runs right by the front of my complex, right? Um, but we had a cat get sick last September, right? My wife loves cats. I'm not a cat person. Okay. <laughs> um, and I'm sitting there and, the cat's got having pro I, I'm like that cat. If we don't get that cat to a vet, that cat's gonna, not going to make it through the night. Right. So we went to a 24 hour veterinarian. And so we were there, we got there at midnight. We got finished at 12, no, 2 a 2 30 AM. And we called an Uber to go home. Right. And I knew it was right on the, right on the edge from a very good, safe, place to a really bad place uber says he's three minutes away it's super busy upstairs there's apparently a lot of animals having troubles guy takes us down to the lobby and so it's second story is the vet bottom story is a pet shop so we walk outside at 2 30 in the morning in a place that i know the next block over is a bad neighborhood right Suddenly the Uber, my, 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 it's cold. I got my down jacket. I unzip it. I wrap it around my wife. I'm holding her. The main the main road's maybe 100 meters away. Uber's coming. We can see it. Then all of a sudden it says, no, not two minutes, four minutes. So now we're outside longer, and the sky comes around the corner. Now it's September in southern Brazil. It's cold. Mm-hmm. It's 2.30 in the morning, and this guy's wearing shorts, uh, Javianas, and a tank top, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, S word. I don't know what I get away with here. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I, I take my wife and I put her behind me and the guy comes up and he's like, give me money. I'm, like, I'm looking at the guy and I'm like, I don't got any money. I just paid for the cat. Veterinarians are damn expensive. And he looks at me, and my, my I hear my wife rustling, and she goes, oh, "I've got some change, right?" And so I'm like, "I got some change too." And I reach in my pocket, and you know, you know Brazilian uh, cambio. Mm-hmm. He gave him eight hay eyes. Yeah, right, a buck sixty, and he's looking at us, and he's trying to figure out what he if he wants to believe us or not, you know. And then the Uber comes around the corner and the guy sees the Uber and he takes off. And I get in the Uber and the Uber driver goes, what was going on? I'm like, we just got robbed. <laughs> he goes, <laughs> how much? Did you see a gun? I'm like, no. I go, it's like, you know, eight hay eyes. And he goes, that's scary. I'm like, yeah. And I look at my wife and, my, you know, my wife's fifth generation of Porto Alegre, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> I go, we both screwed up, right? Mm-hmm. We we forgot because we're worried about the cat. We forgot about the important thing here. We're damn lucky, right? So that goes back to your guy who's been in El Salvador twice, right? I was in El Salvador in 84. Yeah. It was a different El Salvador then. I was there right? in 2003, and it was still a very different El Salvador. I mean. Yeah, 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 yeah. The expats don't get it, right? They don't get, many of them don't get it. Like there's a guy on the forum that said, uh, you know, what was the, tell us your worst experience, you know, with bank or that wasn't banking. Anyway, worst experience as an expat. And the guy wrote, I go to the bank and they don't speak English, you know? (laughs) So, you know me, I'm going to ask, well, where the hell were you? Mm -hmm. So he comes back. I was in Haco Beach 
Costa Rica. And I'm like, well, I understand your frustration, but you realize Costa Rica is a Spanish speaking country. I'm like, I feel your frustration, but how long have you been there? This is what I wrote in the response. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sure it showed up in the moderator queue, potentially uh, adversarial. And the guy, the guy responded and he said, I've been here four years. Now, I yeah, think that's irresponsible. I do as well. I think that learning the local language, learning the local culture and history, it falls under the, 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 the umbrella of personal responsibility. Hence yeah. why I have, on a very regularly regular basis, talked about courses, that, courses programs, yeah. things that, like real resources that people can use, like storylearningcourses.com, my friend Ollie's program. I used it. Yeah. I actually used it myself and I can actually speak Spanish because I went through with it. I didn't just show okay. up in an um, expat country and then go into a bubble and only speak to Americans and Canadians. I have Panamanian friends and we go out for drinks together and we chit chat. And no, no, no. When we were eating together, your, you know, your family was with me. I'm, I, I observe. Okay. That's one of the things I do. I observe and you and your wife were carrying on a full conversation with the waitress in Spanish, no problem, right? Yeah. Uh, okay, that's another validation, you know. Okay, Mikel's real, right? Now, and, and back to the point: the digital world's great, but you need to sit with people for sure, right? So, yeah, no, I, I totally, uh, yeah, that. So I was good, Mikel, right? You didn't, you didn't hear what I said to him was, hey. Put some time in on that Spanish. You won't get as frustrated. And instead sure. of you bleepity bleep 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 bleep, <laughs> which I'm capable of, I admit it. And <laughs> and quite frankly, you know, sometimes I've gotten blocked by group members, which, you know what? It's unfortunate because if I thought I was out of line, I'd probably reach out and say, hey, I was a bit out of line, right? But that I'm precluded from that. I just... You know, I, I I think responsibility and, and being patient with each other and being respectful of the places we live in and the culture that we live in and assimilating to those things. It's all about respect. 100%. And if we just if we disagree. Don't stop talking. Try to find the common ground. And, you know, I, I change my opinion from time to time. I know that many people won't believe that. But I do. I'll listen to you. And if, well, shit, I was wrong. You yeah. know? So. No, I think it's a, I think it's also, well, definitely personal responsibility, what we mentioned, but also a sense of maturity. You know, there's so many people right now, especially in this divisiveness world that we live in right now, that they think that changing their opinion is a, is a sign of weakness. And they have to like double down on all of their opinions and really, you know, plant their feet. And I think that this is a, terrible way to do it actually i think that we should be open to new ideas and we should be discussing things and let's yeah. talk through it you know and as to your point on learning the culture and you know adapting yourself to it a hundred percent that's why this program is called the expat money show it's not called the tourist money show or go to an all-inclusive resort money show i mean it's about really connecting in the country and part of that is showing the people of the country that you respect them by learning their language, learning their history, learning their food and mm -hmm. their culture, yeah. having local friends. I mean, that's, it is a piece of the puzzle. Oh, cool. okay. This is back to my, uh, I'm a little, dis you know, I have some issues on the spectrum. <laughs> Remember uh, Mr. Uh, Garibaldi and Anita? Yeah. Guess where they left when they left Brazil because they were kind of, you know, they, the war was over and they were not kind of uh, happy the Imperial Brazilians were happy. Guess where they went next? Tell me. Uruguay. Oh, they really? Uruguay get their freedom. You know where they went then? Tell me. Italy. Okay, back to Italy. Italy became completely uh, free, right? And and there's a huge stat. You've been to Rome, right? Yep. I know. I was have. there last year. Yeah. Do you, <laughs> do you know that there's a statue of Anita Garibaldi? overlooking the Vatican? I may have seen it and not even realized who it was. Yeah, she's up on the hill 
not in the Vatican itself, because yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, Mussolini put her there because okay. he was having a, he was having an argument with the Pope, and so he put her there as a hey, freedom fighters, don't forget, right? Mm-hmm. It, it, the, the hit to know the history of a place is amazing, right? It's amazing, and it does nothing other than make you open to perceiving the world in a way that is respectful to others and actually might make you smart. I mean, I I suffered from the American education. You know, all I knew about Latin America educationally was uh, was Teddy Roosevelt, you know, ran up some hill somewhere in Cuba, I think, right? And then the wars that allowed us to see to uh, take parts of Arizona and, and New Mexico and make it, you know, the United States, right? I had no, I had no idea of, hey, you want to know about the independence uh, date of any country in Latin America? Just, if you don't know, just say 1820, right? And everybody, but nobody understands the connection of that, right? That's the beginning of the Monroe doc, doc, mm-hmm. Doctrine, right? And that pushed the United States was incapable, but allowed the British to help the Americans push everybody out of the Western Hemisphere, right? And and that's when all those guys walked. Everybody, Brazil walked away from Portugal. Mm-hmm. Everybody else walked away from Spain, right? It, it puts it all into context. And you under, you started understanding it. You want street cred? Tell a Guatemalan that. You know, he used to be part of Mexico after he got done bashing Mexicans. Mm-hmm. Literally, woman said, "Then that's not true." And then <laughs> the next day, she came out to me. She said, "Oh my God, it was true." I'm like, "Yeah, I know." Yeah, or Panama so, and Colombia, or uh, yeah, British and, Honduras, and, and, and I mean, yeah, and, and you live in Panama. It used to be part of Colombia, but most people don't know that. Correct, right? Yeah. So you know, it's just. Once you get to that level of understanding of the history and the regions and you understand, it just makes everything easier. It gives you so, it it makes it so much easier for you to assimilate, right? Well, talking about the historical part of it, there is actually a really phenomenal Netflix series. I'm not a a huge TV person, but Bolivia, it's a 60 part mini series. I'm not sure how many it is at 60 hours, but it's his entire life from childhood all the way up until the very end. And it goes through in Simon Boulevard. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. well worth watching. And I watched it in Spanish. So I actually got to watch it in the native language that it was attended yeah. to, opposed to, you know, dubbing it or something like that. But even if you have yeah. to just read the subtitles or dub, it's very well done. And it really explains a lot of the history in South America and what they were going back and forth on and his entire life. It's uh, it's very, very interesting as a, uh, as a good starting to, ground for it. people who are interested in this history. Yeah. You know, the other thing I, I, I would want to convey to people about Brazil that haven't been here is uh, I don't think there's any other country in Latin America that loves Americans the way Brazilians do, right? That's a pretty strong statement because I think that a lot of Latinos really um, love the U.S. and have this. The U.S. has done a phenomenal job of exporting culture. I think it's their their largest export in the world. No, no, no. I'm not saying that. I'm Ah. saying you don't get... One of the other big topics in the group is gringo pricing, right? Sure. Okay, gringo pricing exists here, but I don't see giant 40-foot-tall blow-up statues of the Statue of Liberty anywhere else in Latin America. Okay. Did you get a, did you get across the bridge over to San Jose when you were yes. in Florida? Yeah, of course, of course. Did you see the big the the, the department store with the big 40-foot-tall blow-up? Mm, does sound familiar, actually, now that yeah. you mention it. Yeah, because there no, was a, all, a churrasco restaurant that we used to go to weekly and it's so good um you would get over to sao jose and go to the south yes and it was on the ocean side of the freeway yes correct yeah correct. i know which one you're talking about. that's so cool <laughs> unbelievable food unbelievable yeah no it's amazing yeah so so you know i've never felt 
gringo issues here. Mm. You know, I've, I've, I've felt them in other countries. Panama, not so much, right? Because of, of the, well, there's a long conversation there. The Panama Canal, right? But yeah. Uh, well, you, you also know, can't gouge expats in Panama because they make up such a large percentage of the population that it's yeah. just like, you know, yeah, y- y- I, it's like you couldn't gouge the Chinese here. They're too prominent and they told too yeah. much things. And Old, I mean, oldest, uh, oldest uh, uh, neighborhood, of Chinese neighborhood in, in, in the Americas. Correct. There. Yeah. I mean, 10 percent of the population is Chinese. And anyone who's listening, don't take this as China has massive influence on Panama. And they're going to take over. <laughs> I'm t- well, you know, it's coming. You know, it's coming. No, what I'm talking about is that they help dig the canal and they've been here yeah. for five generations or seven yeah. generations in the country. And they're included in everything that goes on here, just like expats. Expats have been here for decades upon decades. Yeah. And there are ne- expat areas and it's they're very open and welcome to expats. So same type of thing. Yeah, yeah no, I, you know, I don't, I don't feel, once you get assimilated, you really don't have an issue of, of getting gringo pricing, right? Yep. Now, if you, if you go to certain areas, like, you know, the north part of uh, Florianopolis, right? Yeah, there's going to, there's going to be, you know, everything's going to be way up price-wise, right? Yeah. Um, which is still way cheaper than the U.S. or Canada, by the way. Oh, Value yeah. for money is just insanely good. I, I looked. I looked at a flat here, here in town, just to let you know the audience know. Right, good neighborhood in Puerto Alegre, not the best, but good. You know, mm-hmm. could walk to shopping. You know, nice area. Yada yada. Um, three bedroom, three bath patio, uh, a prep kitchen and a formal kitchen. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, Shohasco on the patio, whole thing, Shohasco inside the house in the prep kitchen, nice. the whole game, right? Three bedroom, three bath, patio, 337,000 AIs. Wow. And it's I, what, I five point? Yeah, I'm doing the math right now. So what is that, <laughs> like 65, 60, 60, yeah, 60 grand? Call it 60 grand. Yeah. Where can you get that in a city of five million people with yeah, an international nice. airport, right? You know, and the, and that's the other thing. I I draw, I draw. One of the reasons I love the South so much is if I draw a thousand kilometer circle around Porto Alegre, right? That stretches all the way to the outskirts of Sao Paulo, all the way to Buenos Aires, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, and Montevideo and- Airport. Montevideo, everything's here, right? I go yeah. to Montevideo four four times a year, mm-hmm. right? Drive it, yeah, right. So some one of the one of the questions in the expat group was, you know, why isn't any money being spent outside of uh, Montevideo and Punta del Este, right? Mm-hmm. I'm like, have you looked at a, a, a population density map? Yeah, you know, it. I'd be pissed if they were spending forty percent of the tax revenues out. You know, where like ten people, there's ten people per square kilometer. If I was a taxpayer in that country, sure. right? So, you know, it's just that's the other reason I feel so safe here, right? Because if you take that circle, and then you take another circle, like where you live, a thousand kilometers, right? Well, now you've got you got all the major population areas in Colombia. You don't get into Ecuador, right? Mm-hmm. You've got a hub airport, right? I don't have a hub airport, but from here I can get to Sao Paulo in forty-five minute flight. Yep. Right, I can get to Panama on a direct flight. Right. Yep. Um, um. Well, the other thing to think about in that region is that at, there's sorry. the other thing to think about in those regions is that all of those areas, southern Brazil, Uruguay, uh, Argentina, those are all friendly countries. I mean, like, what's your relationship with? the uruguayans like i hear brazilians in southern brazil going oh they're like little brothers to us we we love uruguay there's no problem i mean you tease each other about the football and stuff like that but it's not like these are contentious borders or or any problems like this no so So for instance if i drive to if i'm going to drive to montevideo right the border town is chewy right or chewy if you want to say it you know more brazilian um 
border crossing? Really? No. There's not, there's not, you're supposed to check in, you know, but you, mm-hmm. you know, if you're in town, if you're in the Uruguay side of Chewy, nobody cares, mm-hmm. right? If, it, unless you're going to go speeding, you can get down in Montevideo. And if you're a Mercosul, if you got, if you're Mercosul, you're Mercosul. So no one's going to care anyway, right? Exactly. It's very, very, very different. That's the other reason I feel safe here because, you know, I can get in the, I can get in a car. I can be in Uruguay in X hours. I can be in Argentina X hours. I can be in Paraguay X hours, right? Or I can be out of here, right? Yep. Jump on an airplane. Well, when we've we've had recent conversations about a possible World War Three, if you look at what's happened in traditional world wars over the, the last two, where was the we safest place in the world? You know, like it was Argentina. That's where people were fly, uh, fleeing to. What, Brazil yeah. and Uruguay. I mean, these were the places that people were going to and you and you want to know why because i'm a numbers guy i'm a, i'm a big hard math person okay mm-hmm. you know how far i am from uh, taiwan <laughs> i don't know in numbers but i know um no, i'm eighteen thousand miles away okay right that's a long ways yeah you pretty much you probably are closer if you drilled a hole through the earth to get to there than from here, right? Yeah. <laughs> there's there's I'm I'm sitting today seven thousand miles away from DC. Right. Now the, the shocking thing is I'm about the same distance to London. <laughs> yeah. But but people don't understand how far east you know South America is, right? This place is very isolated. So if the Stuff hits the fan, right? It's not. It's probably not going to happen here, and it's going to happen. It's, you know, just my opinion. Mm-hmm. It's going to happen somewhere between Europe and Russia, uh, or it's going to happen somewhere between China and Japan, and that mm-hmm. doesn't leave a lot of distance. Yep. Right. You know. So I, I, that's the other reason I feel safe here. Yep, and you food know, independent, water independent, energy independent, yeah. Yeah, friendly with is, their neighbors. Again, There's a lot yeah, to be said Yeah, which again for that. is you hitting all the points. I'm sitting here going, is that guy reading my mind or are we just on the same page, right? Yeah, we're on the same page for sure. Yeah, no, so, you know, I, that's kind of where my head is. Um, I really appreciate the fact that, you know, maybe people will understand I'm not trying to be a yeah, it's just my it's just my character, but I'm really not that I'm really not. <laughs> Did that you literally big. just say I'm not trying to be a dick? It's just who I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's it's just you gotta realize I was raised in a house, right, with academics, two okay. parents that were academics, right? Yeah. Four children, right? It was completely okay to have an argument, but you better come loaded with information, right? 100 percent And then And then you had to disengage and you had to say, okay, I respect it. The only thing that didn't, the only thing that didn't get you in trouble, right, was if you, you could say anything you wanted to, as long as you could defend it. If you were just blowing smoke, that you would get, you would get attacked by everybody at the dining room table, right? And so that's kind of, kind of baked into me. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, brilliant conversation. I love it. I'm so happy to have you on the show. And if anybody wants to uh, see all the conversations and the, the, the interactions that we're talking about, make sure that you guys go to expatmoneyforum.com. Jim, thank you so much. If people want to reach out to you, if they want to learn more about you, where can we send them? Uh, right now, just go into the into the expat forum. I'm actually I, I, I alluded to you before. I I, I do a lot of re, uh, writing. Um, I'm probably going to put up a blog soon, and okay. I will I will let you know that it's out there. And I would not just post something on the group saying, "Hey, I'm here." Right? Of course, no uh, problem. Yeah, you know we'll, we can figure out how how it is. Um, you know. Facebook doesn't, I, I'm not going to solicit you DM me, but Facebook doesn't stop you from DMing me, right? And I'll be a friendly guy. 
Well, yeah. As long as you come locked and loaded with your arguments and your respectful. <laughs> no, it doesn't. You just be respectful. You can tell me I'm a complete idiot, and I'm probably going to listen to you as long as you're polite, right? And I think we could, as a world, be in a much better place, right? And and it would allow us to push back on the re, the real assholes, right? I'm a, mm-hmm. I'm a pseudo asshole. The real assholes that want to take away your freedom, right? Because that's the only way we're gonna we're gonna get past the very interesting next ten years that we have, right? And the, and the only way that we're gonna give we're gonna hand off our legacy to our children, right? Well said. Well said. Jim, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it.